means, how quantum computing differs from traditional computing, and what that shift means for the industry. The quantum computing is super fascinating. It has the capability to do computations that would take hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of years on even the biggest supercomputers that are out there today. Now, that's oftentimes in areas like you know chemistry, material science, and underlying quantum physics itself. It's just impossible to do that. And what is interesting about it is we can actually take that and apply it to do brand new things that would be super hard to do, like creating self-healing materials, figuring out you know catalysts that would get rid of microplastics, figuring out how to get rid of forever chemicals. I mean, these are things that we all want to do that would impact all of us positively you know, around the globe. Um, but it's just hard to do that today with any kind of classical compute. And so that's basically our goal. Well, let's talk about how this was able to even be accomplished because the time horizon from theory to hardware took almost a century. Microsoft's own journey started in 2004. There were some setbacks along the way. A paper was retracted in 2018. Talk to us about that breakthrough that allowed this new, com this new quantum chip to actually be able to be possible. Yeah, this is actually one of the longest running research projects at Microsoft. I mean, nearly 20 years we've been working on this. And it's because it's a very hard physics problem. So if you look at it, we had to actually go through and prove something that was theorized in 1937, this Majorana fermion, and we had to turn it into a piece of hardware that we could actually turn into a computer. And so it has taken that long period of time to go do it, but in doing so, we actually figured out a new phase of matter. Everybody learned about you know liquids and solids and gas when they were in, in school. Uh, this is a topological phase, it's a new one. And the only way to figure it out was to actually go create this new thing called the topoconductor. It's what comes after a semiconductor. So it is definitely a high risk, but high reward solution for it. And you know, honestly, that's why it's taken so long is to just prove out the physics and go build the devices and make it go. But we believe it's the most reliable way that we can get to a million qubits and I can fit them on a chip that fits in the palm of your hand. That's just not something you can do another way. And that's why we stuck with it this long. Are you a business owner looking to hire abroad? John is also a business owner who wants to grow his team, and he just... Well, show us what it looks like if you can, and also talk to us about how much it costs. Yes, so this, uh, and I'll, <laughs> I'll try and hold this up here, but this is actually the Myrana 1 chip that I have here. I'll try and get the glare off of that. Um, but this actually is the chip, and with the underlying technology, again, would allow me each qubit, which is the fundamental building block, you think about bits, you know, and bytes in, in, in the chip in your phone, this is qubits for a quantum computer. Each one fits in about one one hundredth of a millimeter. That's why we're able to figure out how we can get to a million of those on one chip that fits in the palm of your hand. Uh, it's a significant amount of work to, to pull it off. Like I said, we had to have the, the kind of new state of, of matter that we had to discover in order to make that work. Uh, you know, it's taken a long time for us to, to be able to go figure that out. But, you know, like I said, you know, now that we've got it, we're going to be able to get to big scale. Talk to us about what it can actually do. If, I mean, this is not commercially available just yet, but give us a picture of what the potential looks like. Yeah, and the way I think about this is if you remember back in the, you know, if we look at our history, back in the 1940s, most computers that we had were actually made out of vacuum tubes. Uh, and at the time, we were always like, well, these are, you know, pretty advanced things. Uh, and then along came Bell Labs, and they figured out this thing called the transistor and eventually turned it into compute, and the industry was born uh, with semiconductors. We're kind of in that same phase of discovery right now, which is moving from the semiconductor to the topoconductor, right, which has this topological phase and it allows this new type of compute to come in. And just like at that point, we're at the very early phases, uh, and what will happen is we'll get very rapid scale, and we'll be able to, now that we've done the physics, we can actually build out the chips, we can make them scale even faster with more power, and that'll happen year after year after year. And then with respect to what we can do with it, like I mentioned, one of the best use cases that we see is going to be in places like chemistry. Um, that's a place where we use even AI now, we're using to discover new molecules and, and build new things. But AI is just an approximate Approximation. A quantum computer actually speaks the language of nature, which is quantum mechanics. That's what makes it so powerful. So when we combine those things together, we're going to be able to do you know, brand new things. Like I said, I'd love to get rid of forever chemicals. I would love to get rid of microplastics. We're going to need to invent new technology to be able to do that. Quantum computers are going to be able to help us accelerate it. And it's just not something you can do on a classic supercomputer. 
Let's talk about the competition because Microsoft isn't the only one developing its quantum computing chip. Google unveiled their own in December called Willow. Theirs has 105 qubits. Microsoft is harnessing about eight. Talk to us about how we can stack these up against each other. Is it a count the qubit kind of race or is Microsoft doing something different in the approach that makes it better? And when you talk about qubits, there is sometimes this race in industry say that I've got a ton of qubits. The real interesting question at the end of the day is what can you do with them? And so I could have a thousand qubits, but if they can't finish an actual you know, quantum you know, workload, an application, it really doesn't matter. Or if it takes a thousand years to finish that application, it kind of doesn't matter. And so at the end of the day, what's most important is not the count of qubits. In some ways, that's kind of a vanity metric. You know, that's for, for any vendor, not just, you know, not just Google, but this is true for everyone. What really matters at the end of the day is can I get to that high count, but make them useful? And that's the value of this topological conductor that we've got, this topological core. These topological qubits have error resistance built in. They're small, they're fast, they're digitally controlled. There's just no one else that has that. So we can get to the scale and we can make sure that they're, they're useful. And like I said, today, you're going to start off with a small count, just like you know transistors originally. There weren't that many of them. There were tons of vacuum tubes. Over time, you're going to get that transition and that scale. That's what's going to help you know, in 20 years of experimentation to get us there. Uh, now starts the real race to, to, to go make the volume up and go higher. So what's the key differentiator between Microsoft and Google's quantum computing chips? How do you know that yours is better than the rest? I'd say there's a couple of things. One, uh, in the Google example, they announced a logical qubit. It does error detection and correction, but it does not do computation. And of course, for a quantum computer, you need to do compute as well. And it turns out that Microsoft actually already has 24 logical error corrected qubits with the partner uh, atom computing uh, which uh, does neutral atom systems you know so that's an example and that does all the way through to computation so we already have bigger systems that do computation there today so that's one example on the logical qubit side which was part of that announcement i say the next thing is how does one get to scale and these uh, a lot of the technologies that companies are using including google and others um, they actually would need to you know, warehouse uh, of, of, of compute to make it work because you can only get so many of those qubits per chip. To get to a million, you're going to have to have multiple chips in multiple you know, places and network them together. So just from a scale perspective, it's going to take a while. Uh, there's smart folks. They're working on it. Maybe they'll figure it out. But in my case, if I have the ability to put a million on one chip, then I know I don't have to solve those issues. I can just get the scale that I've got. Um, so we believe that that's actually going to be a more reliable, more real, you know, reliable way to get to a million qubits. So that's going to be the delta between the two. You know, and the truth is, as a company, we're a platform company. I'm going to keep working with all of the different you know, types of chip manufacturers and the different qubit technology. We want to make sure that they all come through. So we have a lot of partners in the space too. So we want them to succeed. Uh, we just believe that the solution we've got is, is the best and most likely to get to that scale. In January, Jensen Huang said that useful quantum computers are likely 20 years away. Is he wrong? I think that we're getting to the point, especially with this announcement, where we're years away, not decades away. And you know, I believe that part of what Jensen was referring to was some of those scale challenges that I mentioned in some of these technologies, the needing a warehouse size you know, computer to make it work. We don't need that. And so, but if you did need that, then you can imagine how it would take a long time to, to get through there. But from our perspective, the fact that I can put a million qubits on a chip that fits the palm of my hand, they're small, they're fast, they're digitally controlled. That means it's years, not decades. There's still a lot of work to do, but it's, it's not going to be decades out. We're actually finding ways to accelerate even as we speak. Well, even Google said uh, when it released its chip in, in December that it sees commercially viable applications in five years. Is Microsoft on track to meet that deadline as well? We've got systems right now, like I said, that already have you know 24 logical error corrected qubits. And that is the building block that you use to write applications. And that basically started off and doubled every three months last year. We're on an increasing curve. So the next stop is 50 and then 100, et cetera. When you get to about 50, then you have a machine that actually can do more than a classic, you know, any kind of classic machine, any kind of supercomputer, and any noisy qubit system is just noisy qubits. Um, and that's coming very soon. When you get to 100, you're going to start being able to do science. And that's where national laboratories, universities, et cetera, will do some very deep work 
that's coming. That's just the next few years. So from that perspective, yes, I, I do think we're going to see useful computers and they are going to start showing up over the next few years. It'll start being interesting, again, for deep research organizations to start off with. And then as we get more, it'll start to become more something that you know, commercial companies will want to do. Even those commercial companies today, though, are wanting to stay abreast of what's happening, track things, get their own quantum ready programs in place. And we're encouraging them to do that because you need to be ready when these systems get up and start to scale. What is the next milestone we should be looking at, investors should be on the lookout for, that tells us that commercially viable quantum computing is around the corner? I think when you start to see machines that can run applications, not just benchmarks, but applications that really can exceed the capabilities of even the largest supercomputers that we have today, then that's when you're looking at you know problems now getting solved with quantum that couldn't be solved any other way. And like I said, that's going to start kicking in around 50 to 100 logical error corrected qubits. And we're already at 24. So like over the next few years, I do expect the industry we will be able to overcome those and they'll start to come through. And then we're going to just keep going on scale. If you remember your PC days, you know, your, your PC every year, it's Moore's Law, every year I would get double the number of transistors, faster CPUs and upgrades. We're kind of in that stage now, but in the quantum space. What's going to be the first sector to benefit from quantum computing? I really do think that chemistry and material science is probably going to be the one that gets the most immediate benefit, you know, from, from, from quantum computing. And again, the problem is, uh, think about why. Quantum computers are kind of like being able to take, you know, an atom and pull it apart and say, what's going on inside of there? And when that data comes out, then that's something you just can't do any other way. So imagine, like I mentioned, if you like some examples, if I wanted to create, you know, self-healing materials, imagine what would happen if something got a crack and it healed itself. Uh, like I mentioned, getting rid of microplastics, like we need a catalyst to do that. How do we do the, the chemistry, the biology to figure out what that is and how to make it work? Uh, we have actual quantum circuits, quantum algorithms today that could do that. We just don't have the machines that would actually run it. That's why we need the scale. And now that we get the machines and as they come online, we'll be able to run those applications. We'll be able to make those discoveries and have a very good positive impact. So I really do think this area of chemistry, material science, et cetera, is gonna make a ton of sense. I know there's a lot of folks in, in other industries that are looking at how it will impact them as well. Uh, but those are some of the places that we see the most immediate benefit. Microsoft is also a major player in artificial intelligence. Many of us expected that maybe quantum would come first, given we've been hearing about it for so long. But talk to us about where AI and quantum converge at Microsoft. Has AI helped advance some of these quantum efforts along? Yeah, and they're very complementary. And I can tell you that they do work in a complementary way. Like even writing those circuits that I mentioned, we've actually got co-pilots that help people actually write those quantum applications, you know, just as, a, as, a, as an aid for people writing apps. And so that's a great example. And I say on the other side, being able to go do this advanced simulation on a quantum computer, not possible on a supercomputer, we're gonna take that data and we're gonna put it back into our training for our AI. That basically means that our future AI models that we come out with are going to have quantum trained data inside of them. That will make them the most accurate models that we've ever had anywhere at any time. Now I can start asking it questions and it's gonna give me answers that would have been impossible to do before. So they're very complementary. In, in the future, you can think of quantum computing as, as another accelerator. It's going to live in the data center right next to CPUs and GPUs, and the applications that we run are going to be hybrid, and it's going to use all of the above. So it's an accelerator, and it's very complementary to AI. Some investors would say that this artificial intelligence hype cycle has produced more hype than actual reality, at least at the stage that we are now. Is quantum computing going to be different or follow a similar pattern? Well, I think that you know, with any new technology that comes out, oftentimes we do spend time trying to figure out what is it good at, what is it not good at. Sometimes we think it's good at one thing and we try it, you know, and that's that's pretty much always been true with disruptive technology. And so we're seeing that playing out here. And I think quantum has had some of those same kind of questions, like what's it good at, what is it not? And you know, as we get it up to scale, we'll, we'll, we will go figure you know figure that out. Um, but I, we do see places where it's directly applicable, um, you know, and that because of that, we're actually old 
already writing, you know, quantum algorithms, we're already applying it. We've already seen examples where quantum designed algorithms, even when run on a classic computer, uh, have found, you know, breakthroughs, which is fantastic. So, you know, there's always going to be this opportunity for us to be able to advance the state of the art. Uh, and we'll get more mature as the machines get more mature, you know, just in the same way that, you know, previous disruptive technology has followed that same path.